Good afternoon. I'm Wes Smith, the Executive Director of the Association of California School Administrators. We just heard the governor's budget proposal, and right now the AXA governmental relations team uh, is combing through it with a fine-tooth comb. Uh, we'll have an analysis for you. Let's start that again. Okay. Right out of that. I'm sorry. Okay. Good afternoon. I'm Wesley Smith, the Executive Director of the Association of California School Administrators. We've just heard the governor's budget proposal. Right now, the governmental relations team at AXA is looking over the budget. This evening, we're going to have a brief analysis for all of our members. And by the beginning of next week, we'll have a thorough analysis for all of you. This governor has been committed since 2010 to paying down the wall of debt and finding stable funding for the most important programs in California. Specific to education, he was instrumental in passing Prop 30. Now, while Prop 30 helped us during the recession, it was only a life preserver. And while we may need to revisit that because Prop 30 sunsets in 2016, we still hope that with the historic clout this governor has, that he and other lawmakers will work on stable and adequate funding that doesn't need Band-Aids or life preservers. The governor was also instrumental in rethinking how we distribute resources in California. We called that the local control funding formula. AXA was instrumental in fighting for that local control. And we appreciate the equity that it represents, that our students and our neediest students get additional resources so that they can be successful in school. But we know that the local control funding formula wasn't fair to all districts. That, in fact, not all districts will be to 07, 08 funding levels when this has been realized. And we must hold the governor accountable to that promise that we will realize those 07, 08 funding levels for all districts and continue to look at equity. But by realizing those 07, 08 levels, we have to understand that in 07, 08, we were 47th out of 50 in per pupil spending in California. When we realize those 07, 08 levels in two years, we'll be 50 out of 50 in per pupil spending. And so if we are going to be advocates for the students of California, while we appreciate the increased funding, we appreciate the 39% uh, infusion of resources to get us back to where we were, uh, our students demand more. And so we have to advocate for that adequate funding. Uh, and we look forward to working with the governor and other lawmakers to do just that. Question on public funding and common core. It's something that AXA has been advocating for for a while. Where do you see the campaign heading? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, we believe that for us to successfully transition to the common core, uh, we need more than the $1.2 billion uh, that we've been given thus far. Um, we know that we need resources. Uh, we need technology. Uh, we need training for our staffs. And $1.2 billion doesn't nearly approach that. Now, we know that there are lots of needs. We have uh, mandates. That's a concern in some of our districts, uh, transportation. There are lots of concerns. But we think transitioning successfully to the Common Core has to be one of our priorities. So we hope that the governor will take some of that one-time money and apply it specifically to transitioning to the Common Core and ensure that students across the state, regardless of geography or wealth, have access and connectivity so they can participate in the Common Core and the SBAC. And how do you, how does AXA intend to be part of the process for you? Well, let me just say too, when we talk about AXA being involved, uh, AXA is all of us. Uh, AXA is all of you. It's the 17,000 leaders in the state. Uh, it's the 50-some employees that we have in our association. And we intend to be heavily involved in this process. Uh, we're going to have a lot of legislative action days at the Capitol. We'll be bringing people here to do that work. And those are very, very important to the work we do. But we can't forget that advocacy doesn't just happen at the state Capitol. Advocacy happens in our districts with our local lawmakers. And so we have to raise our voices, all of us, in our local districts with our lawmakers and share with them our needs, our specific needs, and how much we need to fulfill our obligation to our students. 
I've always said it, we ought to be taking students with us to our local offices. Uh, if I were in Morgan Hill, I would take maybe Taylor or Jackson, my kids that are still in public education, and sit them down beside me and say, now look, in New York, they get $17,000 per student. In Morgan Hill, we got under $5,000 per student. And I don't think Taylor and Jackson, well, they're not always well behaved, are, are a third as important as the students in New York City. And I think that's an important message in our local districts. And so to answer the question, we've got to do the work at the Capitol. Our government relations team, our AXA members will be doing that work. We also have to be advocating at the local level. Uh, and to help our members, to help all of you do that work, we're doing legislative advocacy training throughout the state. Because we all know that when we're educators, we're trained on how to educate, how to help kids be safe, how to help kids learn, how to help people be effective in those tasks. We're not often told how to advocate, uh, how to go to the Capitol and talk to lawmakers. And so we've had a campaign this year that will continue where we go out to the local regions and we share advocacy training skills. What comes next? Well, hopefully, with the trailer language and the rainy day fund, what comes next is a repeal of the Problem Act language that threatens district solvency. You know, and this work really began before Prop 2 was voted on. Uh, you'll all remember that AXA was one of two groups that openly opposed Proposition 2. So the work began that day when we opposed Prop 2. We got the governor's attention. He called us in said, what's wrong with the proposition? We shared with him that we fought for local control, but Prop 2 smacks right in the face of local control. It isn't local control. It also ignores the local needs, the local dynamics, needs like transportation, uh, facility needs, special education, at all. It ignores all of those, and that's why we opposed it. We opposed it for that reason, and also, when you're 50 out of 50, or 47 out of 50, or 48 out of 50 in per pupil funding, how can you, in good conscience, take money away from that to put into a savings account when districts already have savings accounts? And so we've been opposed since day one. Uh, we think a rainy day fund is a great idea so long as it isn't linked to Prop 98, which this one is. Uh, and we really have a problem with the trailer language that threatens the solvency of school districts and really erases local control. Do you have a sense for when that work will begin? Uh, that work began when we opposed the bill. Um, I think the question that a lot of people are asking me now is, uh, when will the work end? Uh, when will we have that language revised or repealed? Uh, and it would be irresponsible for me to give you a timeline for that. Uh, what I can say is the work began when we opposed, and it will continue in earnest until said language is fixed and that solvency is protected and local control maintained. So we won't rest until it's done. Uh, but to give you a date, it, it would be irresponsible. How do you feel about the budget proposal as a whole? You know, having served as a superintendent, uh, most of my years during the recession, uh, it looks a lot better than when I was a superintendent. Um, and while that's a positive thing, I mean, we, we can't um, be too critical, right? It's more money uh, than we had last year. Uh, that's growth, and that's good. Um, but we can't get too excited uh, because we can't lull ourselves into a sense of, hey, we've arrived. We haven't. Until our students are valued like students in other states, until we're funded such that we can um, fulfill our obligation to students, until we have adequate funding, uh, we can't be overly enthusiastic. We're glad that the economy is better. Well, we're glad that this governor prioritizes education. Don't get me wrong. Uh, but students in California deserve more. We need an adequate funding system that fully funds our obligation to provide the students the resources they need to realize their dreams. And we just don't have that right now. And quite honestly, we're not even close. So uh, it's good news. Uh, it's better than it was when I was a superintendent, uh, but we're not there yet. So uh, we're happy, uh, but we're not content.
And I think that's the message. Yeah, th this is something that's very, very passionate uh, uh, for me. I'm very passionate about it. Uh, it's always been a focus of mine. Uh, we know that our job in education is twofold. We're to protect our students physically, emotionally, academically, and we're there to help them learn. In fact, scratch that. We're here to make sure they learn, to ensure they're learning at grade level and beyond. And educator effectiveness that's what helps the kids learn. That's what keeps them safe. Um, we've got to do more work in that regard. We've got to be looking at systems that assure that when educators are not effective, when they are not keeping kids safe, when they are not helping kids learn, that we help them. Now, I believe that, that a big part of the problem with educator effectiveness is, uh, related to one of your earlier questions, we're underfunded. Uh, Teachers do not have the resources they need to properly and effectively educate our, our, our students in many instances. So it begins with funding, adequate funding. Let's give our teachers uh, and our support staffs every resource they need to educate our students. We also need to train them because that's one of the resources. We also need to train our administrators and make sure that they are highly skilled evaluators, that when they go into a classroom, they can identify student learning they can identify engagement. Uh, they can look for equity in every classroom and ensure that, that it exists. Um, so we have to train our leaders. We have to have support networks for our educators. If they're not meeting the mark and they want to meet the mark, then we support them. We help them become the effective educators they want to be. But if, and I think this is a very, very small number, if with support and with interventions, our educators are not effective. They need to do something else. Our kids deserve nothing short of effective educators in every classroom, in every central office, in every district office, and I would say in every county office. And so I think educator effectiveness is the issue of the day. If we had effective educators in all of those places I just mentioned, you'd see a difference in achievement, you'd see a difference in engagement, you'd see a difference in graduation rates for all students, and not just the students who traditionally graduate. You'd see fewer students being expelled, fewer students being suspended. So ultimately, you'd see more students going to college, being employed, and not going to prison. So that's why I'm passionate about educator effectiveness. And I believe that educators around the state are as excited about the opportunity we have now as I am. And it's going to take collective effort. And again, when we say educator effectiveness, we're not bashing any one group. Educator is educator. We all need to be effective. All right, no more questions. Thank you, and uh, uh, most importantly, thank you for the work you do every day to protect the interests of those 6.2 million students uh, that, as I've said many times, need us more now than ever. Thank you.